Hi guys, welcome to week 14 of Art History 151. Um, can you believe this is the second to last week of class? That is insane. Um, we are going to try to do a very sort of brief and quick overview of painting. Um, and I know that that's um, insanely daunting. Um, so what the idea is that I have for today is that I'm just going to sort of move through a couple of artistic periods really quick, sort of to give you an idea of what's going on. If you don't know a lot about painting and how we sort of evolve um, in Western sort of dialogue about painting, um, I want us and you guys to have sort of a general knowledge of that. So my idea here is that I'm going to try to get from a little bit like proto-renaissance, which is sort of pre-renaissance, um, to Baroque. And I'm going to try to do it in a very short amount of time, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, but I will put the notes in the PowerPoint so you can take a look. Hopefully um, this won't scare you too much. I'm not trying to overwhelm you with too much information. I just want you to have a feeling um, for what is going on in painting um, in sort of this renaissance period, which is very well known um, as up to sort of the Baroque period. And then I'll have you sort of watch um, this documentary episode to give you an overview of um, Caravaggio's work. So when we talk about painting, there's a lot of painting up to this point that I'm not gonna be mentioning here, uh, but I wanna give you sort of an overview of Renaissance painting and sort of what happens afterwards. So as you move into taking modern art, um, in at my ad sort of next year that you have kind of an idea of what came before this We have two paintings that are kind of considered quote-unquote proto-renaissance Which really means that they're pre-renaissance works and the reason I'm starting here is because the figure on the right Giotto uh, Di Bondone is considered sort of the father of the Renaissance and really the first Renaissance painter and here I have him um, as a comparison between his work and the work of his teacher, Cimabue, who is here on the left. And so their two works sort of symbolize um, the sort of easy works to look at, to sort of compare them and to think about um, the change from sort of medieval um, and other sort of artistic um, trends in art history and then into the Renaissance period. So let's say that you're looking at the left at Cimabue's. Um, his work is kind of naturalistic. You have a somewhat sense um, of space. However, you can start to see sort of the little details um, that make you think that he's not necessarily in the Renaissance style. And when we talk about Renaissance, this is the rebirth of sort of humanism, of artists going back to looking at Greek art and Greek sculpture, wanting to produce images that are natural, that are using linear perspective, um, etc. And so Chimabue is not necessarily attempting to do that. Um, so in his work, you can sort of see sort of these medieval constructs. You have um, this highly decorative fabric that's not necessarily naturalistic uh, with the use of gold highlights. You have that all of the figures' faces look very similar. So even Mary's um, looks the same as all of these little angels. You can also tell that this space is kind of different, although it looks like Mary is sitting on a realistic throne that is in somewhat of a linear um, or uh, general perspective sense. Um, you do get the sense that if she tried to step off of this, she would just fall into oblivion, right? Like, where is the ground in this space as she has these prophets underneath her? And so when you see this change over from Cimabue's work to that of Giotto, you see how Giotto is kind of considered the father of the Renaissance. You have all of these different faces that are sculpted um, much more naturalistically and realistically to look like these individuals and apostles. You have the Virgin Mary who looks like she has weight um, and that she is a figure underneath all this fabric um, with the drapery being more um, realistic as well as sort of Christ moving to this sort, sort of more baby-like um, imagery. And again, her throne being something that moves into space a little more naturalistically as well. And these are very large paintings. So when you look at them, they're these big sort of altar pieces. Um, if you ever get to go look at them in the Uffizi, you can actually get a good sense um, of what um, is naturalistic versus not naturalistic about each painter and sort of what characteristics move sort of Giotto towards Renaissance painting here. So um, I've given you sort of an overview here of Madonna and Christ. Um, 
I had a professor who always told me that you can tell how old a painting is um, from how scary or ugly Christ is. Um, so how much he looks like a um, a little man baby in Chimabue's versus maybe a little more cute and charming in um, Giotto's. So Giotto really is considered the father of the Renaissance and really starts sort of diving into Renaissance characteristics of painting. So this is the Arena Chapel, which he's very well known for in fresco painting. Remember, fresco is painting on wet plaster and letting the color sink into it. Whoopsie daisies. And so Giotto is well known for this chapel. And as you can see here, I've shown the chapel here. This is a fresco painting as well um, that features Enrico Scrovani. Uh, sometimes it's also called the Scrovani Chapel because they commissioned this series of paintings. And uh, it has a, several cycles going on, um, sort of a complete Christian cycle involving the life of the life of the Virgin Mary and her parents, um, as well as for the life and mission of Christ with them, the Passion and Crucifixion. So we're going to be looking at this painting here that's on the right of the wall, or the left, I just said right, goodness gracious, um, which is the Lamentation. And this work is where you really start to see some of these naturalistic characteristics coming out in Giotto's work that sort of makes him the father of the Renaissance. So you have um, a sense of perspective here, you have the moving back into space of this wall um, along with this tree. You also have this great sense of emotion that's going on in this scene. You have the Virgin Mary who's holding Christ, um, and you can see sort of the sadness on her face as she's holding her son um, who's dead. Uh, you also have all of these other figures who move back into space, um, as well as other figures who are mourning as well, such as John the Evangelist who's throwing his hands back in sadness, as well as Mary Magdalene who is touching the feet of Christ. Also a great use of foreshortening in this. So you have that um, these figures realistically move back into space. So when you're looking at all these little angels who are mourning the death of Christ here, you can see that they're being foreshortened realistically in space and they're not just sort of flat on the picture plane. You also have that um, Christ and Mary are not the center of um, the image. Usually when you see Christ and Mary, like even with the images we were just looking at, they're usually in the center to bring focus to them. This is not the case with this. Um, Giotto is bringing in um, all the emotion to this moment, but it is not centered. Um, additionally, this image is missing the cross, right? You don't even have the cross in which he is brought down from. And so it's a quite different scene than um, other Lamentations where you see the cross um, and Christ has just been brought down to be um, put in his tomb. You also have that the figures are starting to look like they have form and weight um, and bodies underneath the clothing. And you have a good sense of light and shadow. And the sort of final interesting uh, feature of this work by Giotto is that you have these figures who are sitting here down the bottom who you can't actually see, right? Their backs are completely to you. And the reason that Giotto does this is to give you a sense that you're being invited into this scene and that you're a part of it. So when you're looking at it in the arena chapel, you feel sort of connected to this image of Christ. And this work is really considered one of the starts um, of to of sort of the Italian Renaissance. And so when we talk about the Italian Renaissance, again, we're talking about this move back to classical images from Greece and Rome, as well as humanism and more movement towards a more involved sort of quote unquote democratic um, government. You also have the Medici patronage, which is a big part of the Italian Renaissance in Florence, uh, where most of this work is being produced. We have these bankers, so Giovanni di Bici di Medici is establishing the family fortune um, and Cosimo and Lorenzo the Magnificent become these great patrons of arts. So that includes Donatello, Botticelli, um, Michelangelo is basically kind of adopted by the Medici family and they sort of raise um, him and help him to produce art. And so they become big factors and contributors to um, pieces of art in um, Florence at this time, really sort of movers forward of um, Renaissance and artwork in Florence. So when we start to talk about 
um, linear perspective and starting to think about these elements. Um, it's really brought back by Brunelleschi and his work, which we don't get to talk about because um, I literally can't talk about everyone. So I'm just trying to give you an overview here. Um, but this is the famous Brancacci Chapel the work of Masaccio, who was a really famous Renaissance painter at the time. Um, unfortunately, he died very early at the age of 27. But this chapel became kind of infamous because um, it was the location um, where Michelangelo was punched in the face by Pietro Torgioni um, because he was kind of bragging and he was um, sketching with um, friends and um, Pietro punched him in the face and broke his nose and then so this poor um, painter ended up being exiled because um, the Medici family came after him um, for punching Michelangelo. Um, but this became a famous place for people to come and study art and fresco painting such as Michelangelo um, because of the way that Masaccio painted. So we're going to look at Tribute Money by Masaccio and he kind of surpassed Giotto um, quite a bit in fresco painting because of his use of space and linear perspective. Um, this work is interesting because it's um, a work talking about money, which was really not sort of a normal and um, often used sort of story from the Bible. Um, but it's in the Gospel of Matthew where a tax collector uh, confronts Jesus at the entrance uh, to a Roman town of Capernaum and um, asks for taxes. And here he is, um, the pantsless man in the front. And um, Christ directs St. Peter to the shore of Lake of Galilee um, and gets this tribute coin out of the mouth of a fish um, and returns to pay the tax collector. Now, what's interesting about this work, um, not only sort of in the way that he uh, paints it, uh, but the way that he uses um, continuous narrative. So what you have here is sort of three parts of the story all depicted in the same fresco. So here um, in the front, you have um, the tax collector here, Christ in the center, and he is directing Peter um, to get the tribute money. And you can almost always recognize Peter by the way that he's dressed. Um, he's almost always wearing an orange cloak of some sort um, and often blue underneath. So he directs Peter, who then goes to the shore, gets the coin from the fish, and then brings it over to the tax collector here, right? Same person without pants, um, and gives it to him. So this use of continuous narrative is really important to fresco paintings. So you can sort of fit a whole story into one little um, image here. He also has a great use of linear perspective. So again, you have um, linear perspective as invented by Brunelleschi, like I said, um, in which images um, are using um, linear perspective, which is to discover mathematically the relative size of rendered objects to correlate them with the visual recession of space through the use of a horiz horizon line, horizon line, good lord, and vanishing point. Um, and so you can see that here, Christ often being the vanishing point or focal point of a work um, and sort of leading out so that everything is based on um, his face and measured by that um, through the orthogonals. He also uses aerial and atmospheric perspective, which means that the sense of color and line decreases towards the background to show depth. So you have the, the colors up front are brighter, and then with the darkness of the landscape, he uses that um, to sort of give you a sense of depth through this aerial or atmospheric perspective. So you can see that here. This is another part that's on the side here. Let me show you um, right here that we're going to talk about as well, um, which is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, um, also in this um, Brancacci Chapel. And this work becomes very famous in the representation of Adam and Eve because of the extreme emotion of the scene. So you have where they're being cast out into the desert, and you can see this intense emotion that's on the face um, of both Adam and Eve as sort of they have this downcast and extreme sadness um, moving into this landscape. So again, this sense of emotion is important, right, with Giotto doing it as well in the Lamentation, um, as well as the use of giornata, um, or not giornata, that is um, chiaroscuro, which is that the gradations of light and dark to create modeling. So again, you can see that here with the shadowing. shadowing. And then giornata is seen here 
Um, you can see it in the background of Giotto's work as well as right here. And um, that it means a day's work, which is represented in fresco. So you can see that, um, as I said, this is painted in fresco and um, each day you would sort of pick a spot that you would work in and paint it um, and then come the next day and you would paint um, different spots of the painting and you can see it here too and you can see that on one day Masaccio didn't maybe match up the color as perfectly as he would have liked to and thus you see sort of the separation of color um, here right and you can see that in Giotto's background as well. Other famous Renaissance painters include Sandro Botticelli. We talked about this work a little bit um, with the album cover for Lady Gaga, but with The Birth of Venus, um, this is a very famous work commissioned by the Medici family um, for a wedding, and this work was um, carried on pedestals um, around the city during the marriage, um, which is very interesting. But you have this moment um, of The Birth of Venus, and she covers herself up sort of in modesty. Um, it's based on sort of this these uh, mythological myths of Greek and Rome, right? Um, what you oops, what you have here um, is on the left. You have um, Zephyrus carrying Chloris, and they're blowing on Venus, um, who was born of the sea foam and carried on a cockle shell to her sacred island of Cyprus. Um, and then on the right, um, you have the nymph Pomona, who's running to meet her with a brocaded mantle um, to cover her up. You also have the gorgeous sort of flowers falling here, as well as the interesting representation of water. You see that although um, Botticelli is playing with naturalism in his work, he's not necessarily trying to represent a natural landscape um, because this is a Greek myth, this is not reality. So uh, Venus in the center comes to represent purity and beauty, um, as well as love and modesty. And so she would have been um, a good image, a good painting to, for the Medici family to present as a gift for um, a wedding. So we're also going to talk about the Northern Renaissance, uh, which was also occurring outside of Italy in Florence um, and in um, Flanders as well. And we're going to look at some three three key differences from Italy. So oil paint um, is something that's going to be used specifically by usually Northern Renaissance and Flemish artists um, versus fresco and tempera, which you saw here. Uh, this is because they want to have thick layers and rich color as well as intricate and realistic detail. Um, art is specifically used as a devotional act, um, all under God and God's hand in nature. And then finally, genre scenes and symbolisms, which are scenes of everyday life um, that biblical stories can sort of happen in as well. As well. Um, you'll see pale skin and big hens. Um, they're not necessarily focusing on perfection, but kind of densely packing um, scenes with images and ideas and items. Now, when I say art as a devotional act, um, these works, so we're going to be talking about this Marode altarpiece here by Robert Campin. Um, it was a work used for how in the house for private devotion. It was a biblical scene that was supposed to be kind of taking place in a Flemish home itself to sort of make you connect individually with these biblical scenes um, and sort of not concerned with 3D space as much. And um, like I said, they're going to be representing sort of minute details as metaphors. And so these works were often quite small and used for private devotion in individual families um, home. So for example, here um, in the Robert Campin um, Marode altarpiece, you can see the patrons here on the far left um, side who are Peter Engelbrecht and Margaret Schrinmakers, um, who um, are the patrons and represented and they would have had this in their home. So this piece is, you can see it's very sort of detailed and intricate and represents um, this very particular genre scene um, with intense symbolism. And we're going to be looking sort of at this centerpiece of the Annunciation um, and then looking at the right here. So the Annunciation in the center here is where um, the angel Gabriel here on the left comes to tell the Virgin Mary that she's going to become pregnant with Christ. Um, it's a very interesting scene in that um, you can see that it's not quite naturalistic. We have a very sort of um, elongated perspective that's not linear at all, right? We're elongating it so that you can see all the different uh, details on the bench and the table, right? This table wouldn't be bent towards the figures. It doesn't make as much sense. Um, so you also have Mary who's sitting here on the floor, 
um, which is a representation of purity. You can also tell from um, things like the details of the cloth or the clothing that they're not interested necessarily in naturalism. I mean, look how much, even though this is gorgeous and intensely intricate, it's not really how fabric would sort of naturally fold on the ground, if you get um, the sense of what I'm saying here with this image. So here we have a close-up here, and you can tell that at this moment, um, the Virgin Mary is um, being very pure and pious, right, reading a book, um, very sort of thoughtful. And she hasn't quite yet noticed um, that Gabriel has walked in or flown in or whatever the case may be to tell her um, about the coming of Christ. You have all these different sort of intricate details that are metaphors, like I said. Um, you have the white lilies, which are a symbol of purity and the three blooms or three types of openings um, that three is very symbolic in Christ, um, God, and the Holy Spirit. You have a snuffed candle which is usually lit for divine presence and um, kind of snuffs out um, because of the arrival of Gabriel. And my favorite sort of image here, right, which is above um, Gabriel here is that, whoops, I went the wrong way, is that you have this tiny little Christ uh, and he is flying in from the window and he is about to impregnate um, the Virgin Mary. So this very interesting moment um, of the Annunciation very much painted in sort of the Flemish Northern Renaissance style. Look at that Jesus. You also have here on the right um, an image of Joseph. Joseph is a carpenter. You can see him working here and he's creating a mouse trap. This would have been a metaphor um, for the trapping of the devil, um, representing sort of how Christ is coming into their lives and how he'll sort of snare the devil, right? Um, and um, take away the sins of um, the, his people. You also have the great imagery um, outside the window. This is supposed to look like Flanders, so very much placing it in sort of contemporary life um, of the individuals who would have owned this piece, which are these lovely people here. You can see this in other works as well, like Jan van Eyck's um, Gian Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, um, which is a wedding portrait from 1434 in oil on wood. And this is a very sort of well-known painting. You've probably seen it before. So we're going to talk about it here very briefly again. Hopefully I'm not um, overwhelming any of you too much um, with all this information. But um, he was from the Netherlands and um, Giovanni Arnolfini was um, a ag agent of the Medici here on the left in his very fancy um, fur robes. And this painting functions in sort of three particular ways, which is that it's one, a celebration of middle class status and a portrait of sort of their wedding, a symbolic work of sacramental event of marriage taking place in God's presence and the roles of husband and wife in society, and then third, as an actual documentation of marriage and that people sort of witness this marriage um, of these two individuals. So this is a wedding portrait of Gian Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. Um, she is indeed not pregnant. Um, this is sort of a myth. She is meant to look pregnant because it's sort of a um, good omen for pregnancy, for her to look like this and sort of look like um, the potential for her to be fertile in their marriage. Um, but she is not um, indeed pregnant in this image. This image, the great sort of detail that Jan van Eyck is using with oil paint in creating this really intense detail of this work. Um, if you've ever seen this painting or have a good idea of what it looks like, um, it is absolutely tiny. Um, I can probably show you an image here in a minute. Um, but all these sort of intense details of the fabric and the cloth and the fur all show that they are wealthy um, and sort of well-known figures in society. You also have this being a sacramental event in God's presence. So, for example, there's a chandelier over them that is lit, um, which, again, I said is a representation of God being present. You also have different um, symbolic images. There are tons of symbolic things in this work, um, which I'm not going to talk about all of them. But, um, for example, there are shoes, which means they took off their shoes as this is sort of holy ground. You have... Um, the dog, which is a representation of fidelity, um, the oranges, 
which are a representation of as, as individuals. Um, you can also see sort of other symbols. There are so many little details that I'm not going to talk about, but um, for example, uh, the husband is near the window, which says that he's going to go out into the world versus the wife who's near the bed, um, which is to show that her um, life is sort of domestic and um, pulled towards the home. You also have this image in the background where they are reflected back. So here you have um, the wife as well as the husband, and you can see that there are two figures here, potentially Jan van Eyck and someone else, who are being witnesses to their wedding, um, as well as Jan van Eyck writing, um, he was here. Uh, even this mirror has all of these different symbols of Christ's life that um, connect with this image as well. Here's sort of an even closer up image of that. So it becomes a legal statement um, as a document of their marriage because they are being witnessed here um, and painted. So it becomes an actual sort of um, written legal document of their marriage as well. Obviously, this is a really well-known painting um, that's parodied all the time. I gave you a couple parodies here. Um, I've thrown in a couple sort of coronavirus, COVID-19 parodies as well for you guys throughout this presentation. So here's one on the bottom right. So as we sort of move back into Italy and Florence, um, we move into the high and late Renaissance, which really focuses around three main artists, which are Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo, who sort of all have their particular um, things that they're well known for. So the empiricist, the spiritualist, and the court painter. And all of this ends with the death of Leonardo and Raphael in 1519 and in 1520, although Michelangelo lives, lives um, quite longer than them, and then the late Renaissance as well. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about mannerism and Baroque here. So with the three divine artists, um, these artists are called divine in that they were almost considered sort of godlike spiritual characters because they all lived at the same time and they all were such sort of phenomenal and important artists um, historically to Florence. So Leonardo da Vinci was famous because he was a polymath. He was a person whose expertise spans a significant number of different subject areas like humanism, art, science, and philosophy. He wrote backwards. Um, he's known as sort of the Renaissance man. He was less guided by classical influences. He replicated what he saw in great detail with dissections and medical studies of the, nat the sort of natural world. And um, all of that was kind of based on empirical knowledge. So when you sort of look at his work, um, he has sort of different characteristics you could often see in his work, such as um, a sense of underlying muscle and bone in his figures. They emerge out of a dark background um, in gradations of light and shadow, which is chiaroscuro. You also have sfumato, which he's well known for, which is the application of multiple layers of translucent paint to create di dimensional atmospheric perspective um, and order out of chaos, which is focal point is always very clear in his work. So you can see in some of his sketches here, he was working very hard to sort of understand the anatomy. Um, he was dissecting people, which was really not um, allowed early on uh, because there was a lot of sort of, it was kind of considered sacrilegious in that you didn't want to desecrate people's dead bodies. Um, but Leonardo da Vinci did do this um, to try to get a sense of anatomy of figures um, in his works. And the work that we're going to talk about by him is, of course, um, one of his most famous works, obviously not Mona Lisa, since we talked about her in class um, before. This is The Last Supper from 1495 to 1498 in a refectory um, in Milan. Um, what a refectory is, is um, a place where monks go to eat um, during the day here. So sort of a like a cafeteria type place. So this is in a refectory here um, in a monastery in Milan. And it's, of course, the subject matter of um, Christ, who is at the Last Supper with all of his apostles, where you have um, him revealing to the other apostles that Judas will betray him. Um, and this is that very moment, sort of, as Christ tells all of these apostles um, that Judas will betray him. And you have all of them uh, reacting very differently. Um, and so you see sort of all the emotions on the different figures' faces as they've been sort of told this. Um, and you do have Judas here um, who is sort of trying to feign innocence as well. 
He's very well known um, to be represented as sort of a blacker or darker figure in the images. Um, some people relating it kind of to African Americans, which is a little um, sort of dark and strange. Um, sometimes even to actually putting him on the other side of the table here um, to show that he's being separated from um, the apostles and to show which one he is in the image. We also have a sense of linear perspective with Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Christ's head is the focal point again um, in which all of um, the orthogonals are drawn and the linear perspective is shown. Um, and you can even see that Leonardo da Vinci is using these windows to sort of light the background of Christ to give him kind of this sense of a halo as well. You also have other figures. Um, I'm going to have you guys watch kind of these clips from um, the Da Vinci Code, but um, when people talk about this figure as being Mary Magdalene here, who's on the left, um, this is considered St. John. He was the youngest um, of all the apostles, and he was often um, caught sleeping in this image. Um, so as you can see in this other work, um, by Castaño, which is a little bit earlier than Da Vinci's, which is also the Last Supper, you see that um, John the Evangelist is also sleeping here. So that's why he has no facial hair. He hasn't grow He hasn't sort of hit puberty. He's the youngest of the apostles, so he's often sleeping because he's very tired, and so um, that's why he sort of has this feminine look. Um, and that he looks um, very sleepy. So I am going to have you watch those two videos from um, the Da Vinci Code to get you a sense of what's going on and how people sort of think about um, this being Mary Magdalene in this image. There's been sort of a lot of interesting um, controversy with this work because of its restoration. Um, when Leonardo da Vinci originally painted this work, um, he attempted to use sort of a new technique because he was kind of frustrated by fresco and didn't want to have to apply it too quickly because he was really sort of uh, invested in perfection in his work. And so he um, instead applied tempera and oil paint to the dry preparatory ground and it did not stick to the walls. So even within months of him painting it, it became too, it be sort of flaking off. Um, and by 1550, it was really sort of in bad shape. Um, and, you know, like you, this is a refectory, which is near where the kitchen is, where people are cooking food. And so you have smoke and all this damage that's occurring. And so even in 1550, there were other artists who were working to try to kind of reattach like the little pieces and stuff. And so by the time we get to, I believe 1999, when they finally restore it, 80% of this work is not the original work of Leonardo da Vinci. And so when they redid the restoration, they really hoped to sort of bring back the original idea of what da Vinci wanted in his painting. And this caused some controversy, obviously, because we don't exactly know um, what was originally da Vinci and what wasn't. We can only sort of infer from what flakes are sort of saved and what pieces are saved. I mean, you even have that they cut this door in the refectory right into the painting, right? I mean, how ridiculous is that, that you cut Leonardo da Vinci's painting? Um, but um, uh, conservators and those involved in the restoration have said they sort of matched it as closely as possible. Um, but you have this sort of different interpretations that come um, that maybe they thought that it was the moment after Christ had said that Judas would betray him um, versus during. So when it was restored, it looked instead actually like Christ's mouth was open. So even this sort of minuscule detail that's changed really can change the whole idea of the painting itself. Also, we've talked about sort of the tragic, um, tragic case of um, Nazis in World War II bombing um, different areas. You can see that um, the people were working really hard to save Da Vinci's painting here and to sort of build up this wall. And you can see that this whole building um, was destroyed except for this painting. They were able to protect it um, as it's literally right painted on a wall um, in the refectory here. So, and obviously Mona Lisa is one of his most famous works, but one that we're not going to talk about because we talked about it in class already.
Raphael is the second of the divine artist. He is mel- well more well known for working for with elites of society, um, being a courtly painter. Uh, a lot of his figures have elegance and elongation, uh, weightiness and strength of figures, as well as admired for his clarity of form and ease of composition. Um, I do have three phases of which he worked, um, working in Umbria, uh, Florence, and then in Rome for popes as well. So the well-known work we're focusing on today is his painting of the Stanza della Signatura at the Vatican Palace. And this is um, where he painted four branches of human knowledge, theology, law, poetry, and philosophy. Uh, We are going to be focusing in on philosophy, which is also known as the School of Athens. Additionally, this is where, um, in this building, is where Michelangelo would have also been painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So they were very much in connection with one another um, and conversing, and we'll see how that influences um, Raphael's painting here. But you have this work here focusing in on the congregation of great philosophers, scientists of the ancient world in a fresco, um, as well as sort of um, this conversation about humanism, conversing and explaining their various theories and ideals and ideas. You have also um, um, architecture that has these Roman arches, so very much sort of in... um, the sphere of Roman architecture instead of Gothic, right, that's pointed. Um, Here we have those curved arches um, that are very much part of the Renaissance and Renaissance architecture, Um, as well as these large statues um, that are painted in um, of Apollo and Athena, which are art and wisdom. And again, we have this great use of linear perspective by Raphael, as used by Brunelleschi. And then in this painting, we have all these different groups of figures who are well known um, for something in philosophy or mathematics. Um, The two that are the most important are at the center here, which are Plato and Aristotle. Um, And you can see sort of the other figures here um, looking in upon them. Um, On Plato's side, you have philosophers concerned with the ultimate mysteries that transcend the world. And then on Aristotle's uh, philosophical philosophers and scientists concerned with nature and human affairs. We have um, Plato is here on the left um, with Aristotle on the right. There are all um, numerous sort of characters um, and different artistic figures. Um, You have all of these. You have Euclid, you have Heraclitus, Pythagoras, all these figures sort of working and discussing um, their different sort of mathematics and philosophies, um, which we're not going to study in depth, but you can sort of see him here as I've separated them out. And you also have here, I'm zooming in here on Heraclitus, which He's right here. And this is meant to be a portrait of Michelangelo. Here you have sort of a contemplative figure, um, writing, thinking, um, very much so supposed to represent Michelangelo and the connection here with the Sistine Chapel and Raphael's work. And Raphael painted himself as well on Aristotle's side. Um, This little portrait is of him. So he became very well known for this work, um, really sort of this variety of poses, the way he uses body and um, the use of fabric and flow um, is just really considered this phenomenal um, piece of fresco um, and representation of high to late Renaissance painting. And finally, Michelangelo, we're not going to talk about him Um, a lot because we have kind of talked about him in class a bit but um, he lived to 89 and he was about 23 years younger than Leonardo. He gained an apprenticeship with Gerlandio and didn't finish training with him before he was taken over and sort of adopted by the Medici and influences by Donatello. Michelangelo saw himself more as a sculptor and not a painter, which I always find interesting. So he was focused on titanic bodies. He believed he could see the sculptures inside of the block of marble and just had to finish them and sort of believed in the struggle of man to free the spirit from matter. And so when you look at his sculptures, um, he was sort of more invested personally in that art than in painting um, and sort of thought he was a bad painter, which is, of course, ridiculous. Um, He was very spiritual and connected with sort of God and um, religious ideals. He believed that man was inherently weak and could only triumph with God. He felt sort of guilty and frail um, at times and had sort of emotional breakdowns, um, sometimes breaking his own work. 
um, for example, like this um, image, this sculpture here, which was painted a little later in his life, um, represents him holding up Christ um, with the Virgin Mary, and I believe Mary Magdalene, um, but I could be wrong, um, showing that he sort of um, has some sorrows about how he's maybe behaved or about his sins or feeling sort of um, egregiously fearful for um, the end of life or something to that effect. So like I said, we're not going to talk about his works. Um, I just want to show you here this Pieta um, with Mary um, and Christ. Obviously, he is a phenomenal sculptor and really has um, an understanding of the body and form. Um, and just the way that he sculpts is immaculate. And of course, if you want to learn more about the Sistine Chapel ceiling, you can definitely look it up um, or watch Drew's presentation. He talks about um, the creation of Adam here. So we talked about these a little bit in class, so I'm not going to really talk about them here just for time's sake. Um, here's a nice uh, coronavirus meme reinterpretation. And finally, before I get to sort of where I'm leading you with um, here, if you didn't feel like I was leading you somewhere particular, um, we do have a Northern European Renaissance as well, the sort of high Renaissance of the Northern Renaissance. Um, and we're going to be looking at the Netherlands and Hieronymus Bosch. And I always want to show my students this work because I feel like it's often glossed over and people focus more on Durer or on Titian, which again are great artists, um, but Hieronymus Bosch is such a weird character. And he painted this painting in the 1500s. And people talk about how sort of surrealist work this is and how weird and strange and dreamlike it is that people feel like he was way ahead of his time in the production of this work. So this is an altarpiece called the Garden of Earthly Delights. You do have here um, with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is sort of paradise um, and Eden as well in the center and then hell here on the right. So you can see here um, the figures that he's created and the little animals. The center of the painting is weird on its own um, with the sort of uh, gaiety and weirdness of um, the center and this sort of fantasy world um, of sensations and heaven and paradise, right? The sort of weirdness even um, of paradise that uh, Hieronymus Bosch imagines, right? Like an owl head creature and that sort of thing. But this, you know, is sort of frolicking, ecstasy, sexuality, um, happiness, etc. And then here on the further right, uh, you get to hell. And this is sort of where people really see his surrealist um, ideas take place. Like with the ear that has a knife, um, you have these organs that look like windpipes, um, this figure who people are crawling into. You have weird, weird images like this pig in a nun's habit um, or figures being taken over by other little unsightly creatures um, or even this creature that is consuming people and sort of um, pooping them out uh, as well as vomiting figures or figures being assaulted. So you really have sort of Bosch talking about heaven and hell and all these sort of religious ideas and sentiments in this really sort of cryptic and weird way that is so outside anything we've kind of seen up to this point. And again, this is one of those works that's been um, redone in sort of the coronavirus quarantine. I swear it's the weirdest um, freaking um, reinterpretation ever. So as you kind of move away from um, the late Renaissance and start moving into mannerism and Baroque, we have sort of these focus on moments um, and different elements as well. So we're going to look at mannerism ever so briefly and then move straight into Baroque, which is where I'm really going to have you sort of focus in for your assignment for next week. So with the late Renaissance, you have sort of the move away from rationality and naturalism, right? We've gone to the peak of naturalism with Leonardo da Vinci, with Michelangelo, with Raphael. And so 
um, there's really this move away from that in mannerism completely. And this is going to be greatly used by courtly painters and aristocrats. Michelangelo is kind of working in between like a Renaissance slash mannerist style. Um, and these are some sort of main characteristics of mannerism here. I have six total. Um, selective imitation of work of others and get rid of naturalism. My spelling errors are something else. Unreal and fantastical colors. Elegant and elongated forms. No focal point. Uh, it's not centralized. Complex and harder to read. And stylish and artificial. So, for example, this is Paramagianino's Madonna with the long neck, um, as you can probably tell why it's called that here, um, which is this mannerist work of art. And it has this very sort of theatrical presentation with a very unbalanced composition. We have all of the figures really centered here on the, um, in, either in the center or far left, with all of these little sort of angels and children crammed into the left, and with only this little weird right figure um, on the bottom. He's kind of working in Raphael style in that these figures kind of look like Raphael figures. that They're very soft um, and sort of tangible. Um, but again, moving far away from that with his own style. Um, the long neck is definitely one of the main features people focus on. Um, these elongating of the form is very much part of this sort of theatricality of mannerism in trying to kind of um, over exaggerate some sort of forms of the female so like having a long neck would have been very beautiful and very sexual and so they've overemphasized it and so it kind of feels really creepy and awkward as well some people think that she might have like marfan syndrome but that just seems silly why would he give the virgin mary a syndrome i don't know um you also have this dramatic drapery right look at the crazy drapery in this image right and the way that it almost looks like it's hard and metal and could cut you right because of how many folds there are you also have the baby christ being crazy elongated look how long his body is right again this is kind of um giving you uh some foreshadowing to his death so this very much kind of looks like Michelangelo's Pietà, where you have dead Christ laid on the Virgin Mary's lap. Paramagianino is definitely working in that to sort of give you, here's this cute little baby who's kind of looks like a dead baby, um, and this elongated form kind of foreshadowing here to um, his future um, death on the cross, which is, yes, very creepy and very weird. You also have that he kind of looks like he's falling off of her lap too, right? That he that she's trying to like catch him. Um, and she has these huge legs and hips, right? Her body is not remotely proportional. And then finally you have these all figures I'm giving you sort of um, a larger detail. But again, they're all crammed into this little space on the left, um, which really gives you a sense that Perugian, you know, is really playing with um, this construct and making you rethink sort of naturalism in his work. Additionally, with that tiny little figure, um, which is St. Jerome here down at the bottom. So with that, I want to talk about the move into the Counter-Reformation. And this really has to do with your assignment as well, um, because it really changes art and art history um, and the way that um, religious scenes are represented in art. So what happens um, is that in the Catholic Church there's a lot of corruption and we have the sale of pardons for sins, favoritism in the church, appointments, and church officials sort of pursuing personal wealth. And so in 1517 Martin Luther posts the 95 Theses um, which has to do with the fact that he believes that there's sort of this intense corruption that priests and popes are not using um, their communication with God appropriately. At this time, you weren't even allowed to read the Bible yourself. You had to have it interpreted um, because it was not in any language. It was not in Italian. It was not in German. It was not in any language you could read. I believe it was like um, Greek or, uh, yeah, it was in like traditional Greek. And so it had to be reinterpreted by a priest. And so Martin Luther thinks this is ridiculous, and so he starts doing the first translations of the Bible into vernacular languages so that people can read them, and posting all of these other grievances he has with the Catholic Church. 
and that only God alone can sort of redeem an individual, that you don't have to uh, be going through sort of a secondary figure of a priest. So this establishment establishes Protestantism, um, which is personal faith rather than adherence to church practices and doctrines. And then the Catholic Church has sort of a counter-reformation as they're sort of trying to fight the Reformation um, and the occurrence of Protestantism and bring people back to Catholicism um, with the Council of Trent. So what you have happening is that you'll have sort of two sides of the coin, which is that you have the Catholic Church and their desire to bring people back to the church, and then Protestants, right, who are sort of fighting against the Catholics and their sort of use of wealth. So um, in when we have seen now that Michelangelo has painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and within that chapel you also have this back wall that is painted by Michelangelo as well, and this was painted after the Reformation, um, which is here. And so he was hired by the Catholic Church, again, to bring people back into the church, to make them think and rethink um, what they're doing, right? They want to say, you are going to be cast down by Christ if you don't follow the Catholic Church, which is the right religion. Um, and so kind of scaring people back into the Catholic religion. We talked about this with sacred spaces. So here you have Christ in the center, and he's uh, sort of raising his hand against sort of um, evil in the world and also accepting um, certain figures into heaven and, of course, flanked by the Virgin Mary. So you have different um, priests and other figures who surround the bottom here, um, as well as apostles and martyrs. Um, even, this is, I believe, St. Bartholomew, um, who Michelangelo um, paints, he was skinned alive. Um, it is a portrait of Michelangelo as him. So again, this comes back to Michelangelo being sort of afraid of um, his soul, for, for, afraid for his soul um, as well. And so here then on the right, um, you have also, and towards the bottom here as well, but the right bottom here especially, um, you have figures being dragged down to hell by other demons and devils. So you have, you can see sort of all these figures being brought in, being brought down to damnation. Um, this figure really stands out to me usually when I look at it, that this sort of horror, um, even with sort of the musculature of Michelangelo, you can see the horror on this figure's face as he's being pulled down by this, um, by these demons here see here um, in the movement towards the Baroque period, which is after Mannerism, we're going to have Catholic um, church officials really trying to bring these Baroque artists in to paint on the church walls and to bring uh, people back into the Catholic church. So we have the Baroque period from about 1600 to 1700 slash 1750. You have a increased emotion, drama, and theatricality. Um, it's Italian Baroque style. So again, we're in Florence. There has this focus on staying loyal to the Catholic Church. Again, figures, their figures and forms are still very much focused in on the natural world, so not as sort of elongated and strange as Mannerists, but there is this thick veneer of drama. Um, you can think about the Hellenistic works that we looked at from the sort of Greek Western classicism um, classes before spring break. And this sort of attends emotionality and sort of focusing on the most dramatic narratives and the most uh, momentous parts of a story. So when you see a painting, like for example, um, when you look at Caravaggio's Calling of St. Matthew, um, which I'm going to talk about ever so briefly, you have the moment that St. Matthew is being called to be Christ's apostle. So that very moment is depicted, which is very much in the Baroque style. So like I, I think I showed you this image uh, potentially when we talked about Greek sculpture. Um, this is in sculpture as well, even though we're not talking about that for um, this class in particular, we're focusing on painting. Um, you can see sort of Donatello's and then Michelangelo's and then with Bernini sort of focusing on the most dramatic moment in the story of David and Goliath, which is the moment that David pull back this, pulls back the sling to kill him. So you have these afters and befores, um, but you have here in the Baroque style really just focusing in on that particular dramatic moment. So we're going to be looking at Caravaggio for your assignment for um, next Wednesday. And you're going to be watching this short sort of episode about 
um, Caravaggio. It's about an hour long from The Power of Art. And really sort of seeing his types of artistic um, direction that he's using, who he is as a figure. He's very dramatic. He's very crazy. Um, I think I've had students call him like a gangster. Um, I don't know. So you're going to be looking at sort of how much Caravaggio is connected with this idea of bringing people back to the Catholic Church, um, very reminiscent of Michelangelo, um, as well as sort of um, big figures that come after him, um, like Artemisia Gentileschi, who is considered a Caravaggisti, which means that she was um, really inspired by Caravaggio's work. They both lived at the same time, um, but he had sort of followers who was who were sort of repeating his style. So um, one of the very few early female painters that we have um, whose work is more reflectant even on sort of um, giving powerful female figures um, roles. So this is the story of Judith and Holofernes, which we're not going to talk about, but um, you have sort of Caravaggio's version versus Artemisia's. And even in this, you can see that sort of the woman is the stronger figure in this image than Caravaggio's. Oh, here's some Caravaggio quarantine memes, of course. Toilet paper. But, um, so your assignment is to watch this episode of Power of Art on YouTube about Caravaggio and to write me a 2500, 2500, 250 word synopsis of this episode and connection to the presentation. So pretty straightforward and easy. I'm not looking for anything specific other than sort of a clear, well-written um, synopsis of this episode. And that's going to be due by class time next Wednesday. Also, during that time, we will be having the final assessment, which is kind of like your final exam, um, but it's not sort of exam exam like. Um, but that is the last week of class. So with this a final assessment, it's going to have to be done on Wednesday. So I'm going to give it to you on Wednesday. It has to be done on Wednesday. Um, I haven't quite figured out how we're going to do sort of the time limit and everything because it's so weird that we're not in class and I can't sort of like, I don't want that like maybe other professors are trying to take up your time on Wednesdays too. So we're going to figure it out, but it has to be sort of done and taken within the day. And then we're kind of done, right? This is your final assessment for the class, So, which is crazy. So I hope you guys are doing okay. Email me with questions or concerns. Otherwise, I will talk to all of you next week, last week of class. Be safe.